Hello everyone and welcome to the second uh, time around for Lecture 7 uh, for Week 7 of New Testament. I'm sorry for having really bad audio uh, for the past couple of lectures. Um, I've been having problems with my microphone that have been resolved. Uh, so I'm going to redo this lecture because uh, week seven was so bad and hopefully this will be a better lecture because it'll be my third time through because I've already I had already recorded it before I did the one that I that I posted in the uh, classroom. So anyway, um, I think a big part of this is I'm covering three very important letters of Paul in one lecture. And it's okay because this is an introductory class, but it's hard to introduce um, such uh, weighty letter letters in just uh, you know an hour or an hour and a half. Um, I've had one course on Romans. You know, I spent 16 weeks just studying that one book on the PhD level, and the same thing with First uh, and Second Corinthians. So, and then I did my dissertation on 1 Corinthians, so I know a whole lot of stuff about uh, these three books, but I have to introduce it in a very short time period, and uh, it's, it's very, very difficult. But I think I can introduce you to uh, these letters uh, sufficiently for, uh, for the purposes of this course. Uh, before I begin, I'm just going to move my lecture down a little bit and I'm show I'm gonna show you um, some pictures that I'm going to refer to uh, during the lecture uh, this here is the Gallio stone I've referred to it before in my lectures and I've also showed you this picture before but I wanted to show it to you again because it's so important um, in Acts it says that uh, Paul was judged by a man named Gallio and we know from this stone that Paul was there at a, a sp very specific time period and uh, because Gallio was only a judge for about 18 months. So this is the stone that scholars use to um, deduce where Paul was uh, whenever he wrote all of his letters. You know, this is the only historical... It, um, piece of evidence that anchors Paul's life to historical reality. You know, there's no other thing mentioned in the Pauline letters that we can associate with a certain year for sure. But because Gallio was, uh, in Acts, uh, he was a judge of Paul, we know that Paul was in that in, had to be in that place where Gallio was a judge within those 18 months. So that's where we get all the dates for Paul. Whenever we look at the dates for the Pauline letters, it's because of this little piece of rock. And there's a close-up. This is actually his name. This is a G, A, and then L, L, I, O, N. Is, that's a case ending, Gallio, and uh, it's the brother of Cicero's. I mean, br the brother of Seneca the Younger, and uh, he was a Stoic philosopher that people that uh, people think some people think that he met Paul uh, also, but his little brother his little brother was very influential in Stoic philosophy and in how we interpret um, the first century. The next thing is the Erastus stone and you can kind of see right here Erastus. Um, it is very important for Corinthian studies because Erastus is mentioned in Romans and in 1 Corinthians. Now the Gallio, I mean the Erastus who, lay, who uh, is mentioned here in this inscription um, probably is not the Erastus in um, First and Second, First Corinthians and Romans, but it's a lot of fun to pretend that he is, and a lot of scholars do. This is a picture of a uh, synagogue in 
or an engraving that's over a synagogue in Corinth. Um, and it's uh, some scholars disagree on if it was actually a synagogue or if it was in Corinth and what year was it in Corinth. But um, it's one of the few inscriptions from Corinth that are uh, very useful to scholars. This is interesting because it's a um, engraving. It's, it was a used steel discovered by a uh, Frenchman, I think in the 50s, and it tells of a certain Junia Theodora who protected five local Lycian cities, their Greek cities, from the wrath of a, a tyrannical governor. And she, she uh, housed the uh, rebels in her house, you know, the, the city council is basically who it was, and they rewarded her with this inscription that praises her morality and her uh, bravery and her generosity for uh, protecting the city. Now, this is very critical because it's one of the few places in ancient uh, inscriptions that say that a woman was a patron. And the Greek word is prostatis. And um, Phoebe in Romans 16 from, is from Kincre, which is just outside of Corinth. And she is referred to as a patroness the same word that is used here for Junia Theodora. The argument used to be that, um, it, that Phoebe could not be a patroness because that word is never used for women. But obviously, we have a very good example um, on the, in this inscription. An example to the contrary, Junia Theodora being um, recognized as a prostatis. And on to the lecture proper. Romans is uh, the first letter that we read in, in the, uh, or it's actually first in the order of the reading for today. Uh, it was written in the spring of 56. How do we know that? The Gallio Stone. Uh, p scholars have teased out from Galatians and from Acts and other epistles where Paul was whenever he wrote everything. And we know that it was written from the house of Gaius in Corinth because Paul tells us that. Now, the re immediate reason why Paul wrote the epistle to the Romans is that he needed support from Christians in Rome. Now, the Christians in Rome apparently were very numerous. In Romans 16, he lists uh, 28 people who were either uh, important or people met in their, in their household and they were in a position to give uh, to the uh, Christians in Jerusalem. Now, I put down here that it could strengthen the bond between Gentiles and Jews because um, the Jews could have been the, the Christians in Rome because we think that it, the uh, Jewish quarters in Rome that's where most of the Jews lived. They lived in, we know that they lived in certain sections of Rome, and that's where the Christians lived. Now, I have to caution you because uh, we don't really know what early Christians were like before about 150 CE. And the reason for that, in Rome at least, is, is uh, the Jews uh, were Christians. You know, there weren't that many Gentile Christians. They were mostly Jewish Christians. And the Christians lived in the Jewish quarters. And they blended in with the Jews uh, beautifully. Uh, because they adopted a lot of the artwork and culture of the Jews of Rome. And, you know, the New Testament wasn't really quite developed uh, till about 150 and even a hundred years after that. So the early Christians used the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament. They used the Old Testament as their Bible be before they received all of the works of the New Testament. So it makes sense that 
scholars and archaeologists are unable to tell the difference between Jews and Christians in the early in the earliest period because Christians used the Jewish Bible and they idealized Jewish biblical stories especially Jonah you know Jonah is mentioned by Jesus as someone who he was swallowed by the whale he went down into the grave and he was resurrected after the third day and Christians painted that everywhere it's it's in the catacombs it's in their houses it's on their tombstones you know and Jews did the same thing so it was very difficult to tell uh, who's a Christian and who's a Jew during the early period so uh, the Christians apparently in Jerusalem were suffering and um, it, that's not too hard to imagine because uh, they could be um, ostracized from their household and from the synagogue and defenseless and hungry because they have no support from the support systems of the day which are patronage and family and the religion you would lose all of that when you became a Christian and therefore you are exposed to any kind of suffering hunger persecution um, and well that's the, that's basically the two but anything somebody wanted to do to you they could because you weren't protected by the law and you weren't protected by your friends so Paul is seeking help from the Roman church he wants them to give to the Christians in Jerusalem okay Romans is divided up into two sections by my friend uh, Udo Schnelle now Schnelle is a uh, very renowned New Testament scholar he wrote a inter an introduction to the New Testament and I can't see this I can't see the uh, this is the beloved book by Udo Schnelle uh, you know his name, Udo, very cool name, and uh, my professor right here, Eugene Boring, very intimidating guy, uh, he translated it. So I, I, I know of these guys, uh, know them pretty well. I've read this book several, several times, or many, many times uh, for uh, in my studies because it's it's so important. Anyway, he divides Romans into two basic divisions. The first one is doctrinal, and you get that. When you're reading Romans chapter 1, you see very clearly that Paul is teaching a doctrinal, um, doctrinal content, and that means he, he, it's mostly teaching uh, about God, now and also humans' relationship to God, of course. And then part two is horatory, which means that Paul is urging moral action. And the moral action part is very short. So, I mean, in comparison to uh, part one. And on to uh, literary integrity. Now, by integrity, uh, is, this is going to be a little bit difficult, so I'm going to explain it slowly. Integrity... Literary integrity means, it asks the question, is Romans, as we know it in the Bible, chapters 1 through chapter 16, is it a whole literary unit? You know, did Paul write this as one letter, or is it a compilation of two or more letters? So, if you say that the... That, uh, the literary integrity of Romans is intact, you mean that it, as it appears in the New Testament, that's how it was originally written. Now, you know from earlier lectures that a lot of the early texts are different, and that causes some scholars to believe that Romans 16 is not part of the original letter. And we can see here, I'm giving you three examples uh, that are from Schnelle that uh, show you that different manuscripts have different editions of uh, 
Romans. And we are familiar with literary integrity because you remember in Mark, there are uh, the earliest manuscripts of Mark do not have uh, the entire canonical gospel. You know that there's, uh, there's some verses missing. And um, in this case, the earliest manuscripts, uh, now this is four or five different families of manuscripts, so it's pretty significant. You know, they have, they're missing uh, Romans 16.24. You know, it's right there. You see how it's 1.1 1, 1 through 16.23 and 16.25 through 27. That's the earliest manuscripts, only missing one thing. But then Marcion, who was uh, one of the very early Christians, um, he had chapters uh, 1, 1 through 14, 23. So Marcion's, got, Marcion's Romans did not have cha the entire chapter 15 or the entire chapter 16. Now this is sign very significant because Marcion is a lover of Paul. And he only accepted the, what we call the genuine letters. You know, you remember that the authorship of some of the Pauline letters is in dispute, especially Colossians and Ephesians. That's, those are, you know, scholars who study the New Testament are pretty much divided 50-50 on whether or not those are written by Paul. And then you have the, um, the, uh, I can't remember the name of it, the, the letters of Paul that are definitely not Pauline. They are First and Second Timothy and Titus, and almost no, no scholar believes that Paul wrote those three letters. Now, Marcion was a lover of Paul, and he accepted the genuine letters of Paul that we today, scholars think, are genuine. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and Philemon. Now, whenever those later letters came to Marcion's church, you know, Marcion, Marcion was a bishop and he rejected them. He didn't allow them to worship with 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. And he also rejected Ephesians and Colossians. So it's a very, that is a very significant point. And he also did that with the Gospels. He accepted Luke, and actually portions of Luke, and he rejected everything else because they came to his church later. He was someone very committed to preserving the earliest texts of the church. And the interesting thing about Marcion is he's a heretic. He was excommunicated in the year 144 by the Bishop of Rome because he was teaching, Marcion was teaching, that uh, Jesus only came in the Spirit, and he came to uh, deliver us from the evil God of the Old Testament, and uh, we too need to live spiritually. So uh, Marcion's views actually spread like wildfire around the ancient world, and it would be, the, it would be actually, Christianity today if the Orthodox Church had not been adopted by Constantine in the in about uh, the, the early 300s. So uh, that's something that's very significant. And then P66 down here, you know that um, actually, I think I got that wrong. I think it's P46. Uh, P46 here. Uh, that means papyri number 46 or 66. Um, I, this does not make any sense to me. Um, it didn't make sense to me the first two lectures and it doesn't make sense to me now. But you just need to know that the early manuscripts differ uh, in the uh, content of Romans. Okay, some people think, then, that Romans 16 is a separate letter to the Ephesians. And I know that sounds uh, kind of nuts, but the, I was convinced by this argument early in my Ph.D. program because Paul greets 16 people 
Well, it greets people in chapter 16 who are apparently uh, unacquainted with him in Romans 1.13. So the theory was uh, he greets people who, doesn't, who don't know him in Rome, but they are known to him in Ephesus. Therefore, Romans 16 was written to the Ephesians. And also, several people in Romans 16 uh, live in Ephesus, you know, and therefore it's written to the Ephesians. And the tone of Romans uh, 16, 3 through 16, it's a polemic against false teaching. It doesn't fit with the larger context of Romans. In addition to that, the manuscript tradition excludes chapter 16. Now, this convinced me uh, earlier in my career, but then when I started studying for my dissertation, uh, I uh, concluded otherwise, and this is pretty much why. Uh, and Peter Lampe, L-A-M-P-E, he's a German, uh, he believed that uh, Romans 16 was written to the Ephesians, and that's why I, w I was convinced by Lampe that um, Romans 16 didn't belong in Romans. But, uh, Schnelle argues that Romans is one letter, and he explains these points in order here. Uh, for one thing, remember those people that supposedly live in Ephesus and were unacquainted with him. They moved from Ephesus to Rome after Claudius let, let Jews back in in 54 CE. Now, in about 52, all of the Jews were expelled from Rome, and a lot of Roman Christians, uh, like with other people, they fled to other cities like Ephesus and Corinth. And apparently, a, a lot of Christians moved together to Ephesus and then moved back to Rome in 54. And that explains the uh, presence of Ephesians in Romans 16. And uh, Tertius, now I, I'm not convinced by this argument, but if we look down here at Tertius, he is the only scribe or amanuensis mentioned by Paul. We know that Paul dictated his letters to amanuensis or to scribes, and most probably uh, he had a patron or a rich member of the church pay for that service. And, uh, you know, most people couldn't write in the ancient world, and very probably Paul was illiterate and had to employ a slave in order to, or a scribe, in order to record the letters in the New Testament. And very often, those scribes were slaves. So we could, be ha we could have in the New Testament the product of uh, slave labor, which, it, which will make you think. Anyway, Tertius is mentioned, and the argument from Schnella is that Paul mentions him because there were 16 chapters of Romans. And the, so he's mentioning him because he did a whole lot of work. So I thought that was not a good argument because what's the difference between 14 chapters of Rome and six of Romans and 16 chapters of Romans? You know, you uh, the last chapters are completely insignificant when compared to the 14 chapters that you've already written. So it could easily be 14 or 15 chapters and the scribe be mentioned because it's still a long letter. So it, it's actually one of the longest letters in um, the ancient world. Most letters are extremely short. Okay, and then the argument is Romans 1 through 5 and Romans 16 presuppose the same historical situation and that uh, mainly is, uh, you know, the activity of Judaizers and that is people who are uh, arguing that Gentiles should keep the law and uh, the gifts to Jerusalem that were mentioned earlier. And finally, there's no plausible reason why a letter to Ephesus or to, to, to the Ephesians could end up in the letter to the Romans. Now, I disagree with that point too, and I'll tell you why. It, back in the early times, a church would receive certain letters from Paul, 
and they could get compiled easily together in, in, a, in a single letter. Uh, all you need to do is have those pages next to each other and it could get copied and uh, produced in this in, as a single letter. And part of the reason for that is that the uh, churches valued the teachings of Paul so much that they would, you know, if they happen to know it was to the Ephesians, for example, they would tag it on and claim it as their own because it gives the church more uh, status. So there is, I think, an ex a logical, reasonable explanation for the um, the letter being um, incorporated into Romans, but it's still easier to believe that um, it is it is in fact original. So I'm sorry if that's confusing, but uh, it is something that you need to know about the Book of Romans. Okay, here's something fun. Uh, I think that the uh, mystery religions is probably the most interesting thing that we've covered so far. Uh, it generated the most talk in the forums. So whenever I saw this little tidbit in Schneller, I thought we should talk about it. Okay, let's look here at Paul's concept of baptism in Romans. It appears in Romans 6, 3-4. Don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. Now, scholars have found two parallels in the mystery religions from ancient texts. One is from Aristophanes, who wrote Metamorphosis, and in describing the initiation to Isis, uh, and we, we talked about how initiations are the main parallel or similarity between the mystery religions and Christianity. The difference being the initiations into the cults happened a whole lot of times, and Christianity only had one baptism. So this is what he says about his baptism. I drew near to the confines of death, and we see here, baptized into his death, treading the very threshold of Persephone, which is a literary flourish. I was born through all the elements and returned to the earth again. So you were buried with him, and then raised from the dead, and then uh, at the dead of night I saw the sun shining brightly. I approach the gods above and below and worship them face to face. So we have a parallel to Isis. And now, uh, I don't know what mystery cult this one's talking about, but it says, uh, Firmicus Maternus says, Rejoice, O Mystai. Lord, lo, our God appears as saved, and we shall find salvation springing from our woes, like death. It springs from death and death and resurrection as we would call it so the second one is a little thin but uh, you get the uh, you get the picture okay we're going to go through a very very brief outline of Romans okay you need to know that the thesis statement is Romans 1 16 through 17 and the argument of Romans 1 is that Gentiles aren't saved by natural law. The point of that is he's trying to bring Gentiles under the same condition of the Jews. You know, Jews are the people of promise, and they were given the law by God to please God and do what God wants them to do, and they will eventually be redeemed by God. Now, Jews, I mean, Jews only received the law. The Gentiles did not receive the law of Moses. The Gentiles are held accountable, though, to the law of Moses because they should have known by observing nature. Now, this is called natural law. You know, observing nature 
in order to know God and know who we are. But instead, the Gentiles worshipped the created instead of the creator, and so God handed them over to all sorts of sin. Now, and this is where you get into the issue of homosexuality at the end of Romans 1. You know, it says that God handed, handed them over to unnatural lusts, and there are men uh, laid down with men, and there are women laid down with women. So it looks like God is condemning homosexuality specifically, but the argument is about natural law. It's not about condemning homosexuality. But, as I tell my, um, my friends, um, God is, st I mean, Paul is still arguing that the, that homosexuality is symptomatic of, um, cosmic destruction. I mean, like, what's wrong with the entire cosmos is, is, uh, focused on or expressed in terms of condemnation of homosexuality. So, it's still not positive, but it doesn't it's not condemning homosexuality, it's condemning every Gentile because we all failed together uh, in keeping the law. That's the point of Romans 1. Now, he spends four chapters on Jews, and he really hands it to them because he has to make his argument very, very strong that Jews are not saved by fulfilling the law. And actually, the law uh, condemns Jews because they cannot keep the law in total. So his conclusion in chapter 3 is there's no hope for humanity by itself. You know, if we are left just with the law, if Gentiles are left with the natural law, and Jews are left with the law of Moses, we're both in the same predicament because we cannot save ourselves. The only hope for humanity, Paul says, is the grace of God. And then Jews and Gentiles both receive their salvation through God's grace. Hello? What's up? I know. Well, it's, it's getting really bad gas mileage. Sorry about that. Um, my wife and I have been having car problems for weeks. So, uh, I told her to go get gas because the gas gauge stopped working. But anyway. Okay, what's wrong here? Okay, we were at Jews and Gentiles needing salvation uh, through grace of, of God. Now, in chapter 4, uh, he talks about Abraham, and Abraham is the bedrock of Paul's doctrine of justification by faith. Now, that's something that you need to know, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more. But justification by faith is the idea that we are not saved by our works, but we are justified by believing in Jesus and in the God who sent Jesus. And because of this, we can be led by the Spirit and enjoy the grace of God. Now, Abraham is important because he came before the law of Moses. And he is the father of uh, faith for both Jews and Gentiles. Because Abraham believed by faith, and it was accounted to him as righteousness, you know, uh, faith equals righteousness, which means the righteousness that the Jews thought they could get from obeying the law, that same righteousness you get from simply believing in God. And that is really significant when we start thinking about the importance of what we do as opposed to our faith. So, but at the same time, it's a paradox because our, what we do is a reflection of our faith. So Abraham is important because he comes before the law and he was saved by his faith. And he is the pattern of modern or Pauline faith. And then chapter 6, we already talked about baptism from death to life. And 7 and 8 is the situation of the Christian 
And that's the one, that's the uh, part where, famous part where Paul says, who will save me from this body of death? You know, I am wanting to follow the law, but I end up failing, and no matter how hard I try, I keep, I, I'm in despair because I keep on sinning. And so, uh, you know, that's a situation we find ourselves in sometimes, or, or often, and we put our faith in God, and we're led by the, we are led by the Spirit instead of led by our carnal desire. In Romans 9 through 11, there's a very important lesson that's taught, and that is the election of Israel is still valid, and which is important because the church has a terrible history of being anti-Semitic. You know, we don't recognize anymore uh, that Israel is uh, God's chosen people, uh, or, you know, we should recognize that, but often we don't. And when I say we, I mean Christians as a whole. There's a lot of animosity towards Jews because we see, you know, they've been, it's been said that Jews crucified Christ, and you probably have not said that in your life or heard that from a, from a pastor unless you're older. But the one thing that we do off, very, very often is say that the faith in God in the New Testament replaces the faith in God in the Old Testament. And that goes against Christian history, because Christians made a very, very valiant effort to connect Christian theology with Old Testament theology. And of course, it seems like they failed, because Jews have uh, rejected Christianity. But the important thing to know is that the election of Israel, and election means choosing, God chose Israel for a very specific purpose, and that is to follow him and to be blessed by him. And that's still valid in the face of Christianity. General admonitions, sorry about that, in uh, Romans 12. Um, governmental authority in Romans 13, that's where we get the Nazis used that to get Christians to follow them. That, um, you know, you should obey the person that's in authority. He doesn't wear the sword for nothing. And that put Christians in an ethical bind who want to follow the Bible. So uh, that's something that uh, we, need, we definitely need to deal with as Christians if we want to follow the text. And then in Romans 14, you have the argument of the weak and strong. Um, in 15, Christ accepts both. And then in 16, it has work within the Roman church, all the people that are mentioned in Romans. Okay, justification by faith, down here at the bottom. We've already mentioned it. Um, its foundation is Abraham. And the cool thing about it is, they, Paul uses the same arguments from Galatians for justification by faith. And he uses a weak and strong argument from Corinthians. But... He changes the weak and strong um, thinking in Romans and in Corinthians. In Corinthians, the weak and strong are uh, the rich and the poor, and they're fighting about food. You know, and specifically, they're fighting about food sacrificed to idols. You know, the weak uh, cannot handle that, cannot handle uh, food sacrificed by idols. The strong can, and it's strength because their faith in God is not is not hampered by meat. And Paul identifies with the strong, and doesn't identify, and sort of identifies with the weak. But he will get into that argument later. And Paul modifies the weak and strong in Rome. And he still identifies himself with the strong. So it's similar, but it's a, it's, it's a little different. Okay, now we're getting to the good stuff. I will try not to get distracted when I'm talking about 1 Corinthians. Uh, I love this. I've read many, many books on it. Uh, I believe it's somewhere around 2,000. And yes... There are 2,000 books written about 1 Corinthians. Uh, 
uh, and there is a lot more that I haven't read. So uh, it's something that captivates me, and I can't explain why. Um, it's just fun. It's written in Ephesus in the spring of 55. Okay, let's talk about some people that are mentioned in Corinth. Uh, the reason for this is we get an idea when we study these people, we get an idea of what the Corinthian church was like. Um, first, I look at Crispus. He is called a synagogue leader in the book of Romans uh, for in Corinth. And uh, I question, you know, what is a synagogue leader? Does it mean that he is an important person in the synagogue. Uh, is it just a title? Is it something given only to patrons, that is, supporters of the synagogue? Um, and uh, what can it tell us about Corinth? The synagogue leader, uh, traditionally, is understood as a wealthy person in the community who mostly, most of the time, is a Jew and they take care of the synagogue. You know, they uh, fund synagogue activities like meals, and they defend the synagogue against lawsuits. You know, they basically use their money to keep the synagogue going. And they also, they also have a spiritual role. They uh, lead worship whenever the rabbi is unavailable. So, and that's traditionally but we found recently that there are many um, inscriptions from the first through the fourth centuries of synagogue leaders who were children or women or people who uh, were Gentiles and had nothing to do with the synagogue. And this tells us that most of the time, or a, a lot of the times, uh, this title is given to people who don't even do anything and they might have given money at some point to the synagogue. And uh, the term synagogue leader is not a term of endearment or importance. But whenever it says in Acts that when Crispus, the synagogue leader, converted, he brought a lot of other Jews with him. So it looks like this guy was wealthy and he was influential. But unfortunately, as you know, you can't really use Acts to define Corinth because Acts is not entirely historically reliable. So it's possible that Crispus was wealthy and therefore there were wealthy Christians in Corinth. But um, it's more likely that he is in the imagination of Luke. And then there's Erastus, the city treasurer. Um, I showed you a sidewalk earlier that had an inscription that said Erastus the Adele um, dedicates this. You know, he built this with his own money. And it was a walkway uh, that wasn't too terribly long, but it was a benefaction for the city, which means that he was wealthy. Now, when the inscriptions of Corinth were published, um, Kent was the um, scholar's name that uh, wrote about this particular inscription, and he said that this is definitely the Erastus that's mentioned by Paul, and by and in probably in Acts. I can't can't remember offhand if it's in both um, epistles, but excuse me. But what we do know. Uh, well, I'm sorry I got distracted, but Kent, the guy that published the first, the first uh, inscriptions from Corinth with this Erastus sidewalk in it, he said it's definitely the Erastus, the Erastus mentioned by Paul. And the title City Treasurer is somewhat equal to the title Adele, which is in the title given to the person who dedicated the sidewalk. Now, in reality, the city treasurer is one of the lowest offices in the city, and typically in Corinth and elsewhere, it was held by a slave. You know, it was something so low that even a slave could be the city treasurer. Now, Erastus, 
was a city treasurer in the Bible, but in the Erastus who dedicated the sidewalk was in Adele. And Adele is one of the highest uh, positions in the city given to aristocrats. So if this Erastus, who's a city treasurer, is the same Erastus who dedicated the sidewalk, he made a meteoric rise from the lowest position all the way up to the highest position in the city. You know, it would have been a, a rags to riches story that's completely implausible. So Erastus was most likely poor. And we don't know much about Crispus. So we know, at least in tradition, that there are wealthy people in Corinth and there are poor people in Corinth in the church. Now, the place that I see uh, wealth the clearest is with the son and the stepmother in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where uh, Paul, Paul is just horrified, it looks like, that a son and stepmother were having an affair. And he says, you should kick out the son. Now, it looks like the best way to explain this situation is that the uh, stepmother was a young woman who married a wealthier man, and the man was, you know, obviously the second wife, and the man dies. The stepmother and, and son are stuck in a quandary about who gets what uh, in, with the man's wealth. And the other Christians in the community kept them, you know, did not kick them out of the community because uh, they're busy suing them for the money, that the, the new money that the stepmother had and son. And it's likely that the son and the stepmother are about the same age because of the way that uh, marriage worked in the ancient world. You know, his father was probably marrying a 16 or 17 year old and his son could have been about that age. And so in the ancient world you had a lot of sex like this because they were uh, they had more in common with each other than with their spouse. So there are also many stories in the ancient world about the stepmother taking advantage of her stepson because, uh, you know, she's a seductress and she destroys his life by having sex with him and taking his stuff. So this looks like a, a very probable context for wealth. You know, you have lawsuits, which only are done by the wealthy, and the judges are only wealthy people. And they only sue if there's a monetary gain. So uh, that's something that gives us an idea, a very solid idea, of what life was like in the early church. You know, this church was badly conflicted. You know, they were enemies of each other, and they're supposed to be friends. The other people in the mentioned in the church are Aquila and Priscilla. Now, they, it's argued by some people that they traveled so much in the ancient world that they must have been wealthy. And that argument is flawed because they were tent builders. Now, first of all, you didn't need to be wealthy to travel in the ancient world. And in fact, wealthy people hated traveling because they, they, were, they were subject to robbers and every other hardship that happens on the, on, in, a, in a great distance, uh, travel, long distance travel. So whenever, they, whenever wealthy people did travel, they brought with them all of their slaves and maybe even hired some mercenaries to protect them from robbers and still the, the uh, bandits could be more powerful than their force and kill everybody and take all their stuff. So the uh, wealthy people didn't like traveling. Most of the time, people traveled for business. You know, uh, merchants who were lower down on the totem pole, who didn't have a, um, who weren't wealthy enough so that they didn't have to work, you know, they would travel long distances and they would, they would have slaves, and they would have people to help protect them. And that's how the poor people traveled. You know, they would attach themselves to a convoy 
that was uh, go going in the same direction, and uh, they would they would help defend the wealthy person, and that would be their ticket uh, from place to place. Now, Aquila and Priscilla were tent builders, and you could build tents anywhere. They were in high demand, and uh, they were usually made out of either leather or linen. And uh, Rome was a big customer of that because they covered up a lot of stuff with, uh, with canvas. Apparently, they did not like being in the sun. Um, but Aquila and Priscilla had, uh, they moved at least three times in the New Testament that we know of. You know, they lived in Rome for a while, they lived in Ephesus, and they lived in Corinth. So people think that they were wealthy because of that. But in fact, all they, need, all they needed to do to live in a place was move in and take a shop front. And that would be, you know, that would be difficult if you didn't have friends in the town. But um, it looks like they knew what they were doing. Um, and a tent builder... They only have a few tools. They have, a, you know, a couple of knives and a couple of hammers is all they needed to do their trade. So they didn't have to carry a bunch of stuff whenever they moved. And that's the same with Paul. You know, he could move from place to place building tents because he could always sell them and he could always build them no matter where he went. So uh, they were most likely poor. And then there's Stephanus and Gaius. Now these guys were wealthy because the churches met in their households. Now, to be a homeowner in the ancient world, you had to be you had to have some access to money because houses aren't cheap, and uh, you you know usually your family's been living there for many many years, and they are stable enough to uh, you know support the house and keep everything going. Um, the number of people that could fit in the houses were about, it, you know, it depends on where they met in the house because some areas of the house were larger than other areas. You know, they had um, a big courtyard that could hold up to 100 people and they had the dining room, which I think is where they met, that could hold about 30 people if they're packed. You know, they would usually have seating or uh, areas for people to recline for about 15 people, but you could have another 15 people sitting on the ground uh, because it was in a L shape, and people could sit along the inside of that L shape, and they have their meal together, and then they have their worship, and so uh, that's where I think they met. But they could meet outside in a courtyard that was uh, much bigger, and. Uh, it looks to me like they met in the dining rooms because there are so many churches mentioned in Romans 16 that it, it just looks impossible for there to be a hundred people in every single place. You know, it, it's much, much more likely that the church meetings were very, very small. Uh, but Stephanus and Gaius had to be wealthy to support the church. And then there's Phoebe the Patroness, who I already mentioned. Uh, she's mentioned in Romans 16. Uh, some people argue that uh, she carried the letter there, which I think is true. And she was also the patroness for Paul's mission to Spain. Uh, it looks like, uh, from Romans, that Phoebe is the one who uh, funded his third missionary journey, if indeed it happened. And she is called a patroness like Junia Theodora, uh, whose inscription we saw at the beginning of the, of the lecture. Okay, important teachings. You have the weak and the strong, and that's in 1 Corinthians 11, the Lord's Supper, and Resurrection of the Dead. And I will talk about those more in just a second. Okay, I'll talk to you about them now. The major theological currents in 1 Corinthians, uh, the primary one that every part of 1 Corinthians revolves around is the, univer the uh, unity of the church. I was going to say university of the church. Unity of the church. And there are different types of unity, and I have them, they have them listed on the right. There are Jew and Gentile unity, rich and poor unity, 
and Sophia and Christ unity. And then baptism is something that's used uh, as well, and spiritual gifts. So the unity of the church is very, very important. And whenever Paul wrote to the church, you saw in the first chapter that um, there are people that follow different persons. Like some people are claiming Peter, some people are claiming Christ, um, some people are claiming Paul. Um, that was a rhetorical flourish by Paul. You know, there were not people saying, I believe in Peter and not Paul, or I believe in Christ and not Paul. He's just giving generic examples. You know, he's saying that you're going every which way, uh, and you need to be unified theologically, unified with moral morality, and unified with uh, your social contexts. And uh, we know that Jew-Gentile unity is paramount in the theology of Paul. You know, he's, he's trying to unify them in theology through justification by faith, and also teaching that they are unified in their need for God. Second thing that Paul uses is to teach about the unity of the church is the church is a body of Christ. Now, I want you to know something that's very, very important about that metaphor. You know, Paul says that, uh, you know, what can, can the hand say that he no longer wants to be a part of the body? Or the foot say that? No, we're all one. We're the body of Christ. You know, we need to be unified. In the in some time, some point in the ancient world, I wish I could remember the year, but there was a town that was about to be overrun by an enemy army. And back then, as always, and as now, the poor people were asked to go out and defend the city. They refused because they said, we've been defending the city for years, and we don't get to uh, eat the fruit of that of our labor. You know, even though we keep fighting, the rich are still rich and we are still poor and we don't get anything out of it. And an orator in the city stood up and said, we, have, we are one body. We need to act like one body. You know, the poor need to do what the poor do. You know, they are the hands, the wealthy are the head, and uh, so on and so forth. And according to the story, the poor people took up their arms, defended the city, and all was well with the world. So the critical thing that you need to know is that this metaphor of the body is exclusively used for making the poor do what the rich want them to do. It's never used in any other context. So whenever we get to Paul, it looks like what he's doing is he's trying to assimilate the poor into the context of the rich, but the poor are the ones who have to give up, give up stuff. And we see that in the weak and strong with the meat sacrificed to idols. It's the wealthy who are eating the meat sacrificed to idols because we know from the context, Paul says, when you're invited to someone else's household, don't ask about where it came from, just eat. You know, the rich are already doing that. And they're the ones that get invited to meals, not the poor. And the and furthermore, when Paul says, whenever you get invited, uh, that follows the, pa the invitation pattern in the papyri. In other words, we have a lot of inv invitations to dinner in the ancient world, and they follow what Paul talks about here with the rich and the poor. You know, the rich in Corinth are the ones who eat the meat. The poor in the church are the Corinthians who have a problem with that. And part, a lot of the problem could be that they don't even have access to meat. And they're, they're a little bit jealous of the rich. But we know that, uh, you know, Paul says the, that the rich should, um, you know, the people who eat the meat should accept the poor. That don't eat the meat. And in the body of Christ metaphor, the rich 
don't have to give up anything, but the poor do. So there's a definite argument for unity between rich and poor. And then Jesus Christ alone and baptism, that unifies, that should unify the church because we all trust in Christ alone for salvation and happiness. And we share in one baptism, not in many different baptisms. And then there's the issue of correct knowledge. You know, uh, Paul in, in uh, chapter 1 through chapter 4, he talks about the relationship of Greek philosophy and Christian philosophy, or his Christianity. And he basically says that philosophy is good, but it has failed in something critical, and that is it's failed in knowing God. And in order to know God, it comes by the Holy Spirit and not through philosophy. And obviously, that goes against every single philosophical school that was out there. They all claim to have perfect knowledge of God. And Paul taught, of course, he respects philosophy, but it failed. You know, you have to know Christ through the Holy Spirit. And then there's spiritual gifts. Uh, you know, that unifies the church because everybody's supposed to be using their spiritual gift for the encouragement of others. Second Corinthians, written by Paul uh, to Corinth and all Achaia, which is nearby Greece, its unity is disputed. And by unity, we mean literary unity. This is something I didn't talk about with First Corinthians, but... In the Bible, we have two letters written to the Corinthians. We have 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Now, believe it or not, there was a scholar in the 60s, he was from Germany, that came up with the idea that there are not two letters in the Bible. There are 13. That is, 13 letters between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. So instead of two letters in the New Testament, we have 13. And furthermore, it's not in, in canonical order. You know, he takes like 2 Corinthians 1 and 2 as the first letters of the first letter to the Corinthians and then pieces of 1 Corinthians as letters 2 3 4 5, you know. It's uh, so irritating to me that I'm not going to explain it completely. But you need to know that there are people out there that think that 1st and 2nd Corinthians are 13 letters. Okay, theology. Uh, there's some very common theology in 2 Corinthians, and I'm not sure that there's anything unique in it. Uh, you know, I'm a 1 Corinthians guy, so 2 Corinthians is uh, a footnote. But uh, there's Paul's theology as uh, Paul's existence as an apostle. And this, this Paul's existence as an apostle covers everything here. The glory and suffering... Uh, it means that uh, Paul's existence as an apostle uh, is he has glory in it. You know, he is, he is highly edified and uh, given the grace by God to do what he needs to do. But also he has to suffer. And the root of that suffering is the fact that Jesus suffered. You know, if Jesus suffers and you're a follower of Jesus, you are going to suffer too especially if you're an apostle. That's what Paul is talking about when, when he complains about it. He, he sort of complains about his suffering. You know, he's like, I should be above this, but I am submitting to it. Um, and there's a power to overcome anything. And I want you to write this down. Stoicism taught that, and so did cynics. Stoics taught that no matter what happens in life, you should have the same expression on your face. And that's where we get the term a stoic expression. And in the ancient world, this is a very compassionate and noble philosophy because bad things happen to everybody. You know, you could be in, in your life, you could be enslaved. You, of course, could be, every slave could be raped without penalty. If you're a child, you could be raped without penalty. And, you know, you could be shipwrecked, you could go hungry, you could be thirsty, uh, 
you know, it, you were vulnerable to a whole lot of suffering in the ancient times, a lot more than the average American is today. And, you know, we count our blessings, but it, the Stoic philosophy was so good because they taught people, you know, hey, bad things are going to happen and you can't control them, but you can still be happy and you can still have peace if you follow the Stoic philosophy, which is not that complex. So Stoicism became very popular. And their wise man, you know, when they say, they say you have achieved Stoicism if you are invincible and you have the power to overcome anything. And you'll remember, if you've read Philippians, that Paul says that in Philippians chapter 4, of, uh, I think verse 11. You know, he has overcome all things, and he can do all things by, by Christ who strengthens him. And you've heard that, seen that, I'm sure, on bumper stickers and t-shirts. And what Paul is saying is, and this is critical, he has achieved the outcome of Stoic thought, the outcome of Greek philosophy, without actually practicing it. He's able to achieve the best things about Greek philosophy without following their method. This is critical because if Paul followed the Stoic method, he would be a Stoic philosopher. If he followed the Platonic method, he would be a Platonic philosopher. But he is saying that he has achieved it because of his belief in Christ and more specifically because of his calling as an apostle. And that's what it means to have the power to overcome anything. It means that he has achieved the outcome of Greek philosophy. And I repeat that because it's going to be on the final. Okay, called by Jesus uh, is very significant. He says that at the beginning of almost every letter. Paul, an apostle called by Jesus. He believes that the calling of Jesus sets him apart from every other human being who has ever lived and who ever will live. You know, Paul is set aside for a very specific purpose by Jesus to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And in 2 Corinthians, it looks like there are people that challenge the nature of Paul's apostleship. And they challenged it according to Greco-Roman philosophy. There are people in the church that did not think that Paul had achieved what he said he had achieved because he didn't follow uh, the a philosophical method. He followed a, his Christian method where he is realizing his calling and following his calling and therefore he's invincible. And the he has to demonstrate in his epistles that he is a genuine apostle in spite of their of their protests. Okay, I'm finished. Uh, this is a, an um, outline for Romans. I do not have an outline attached for the other two letters. Um, I might show you, give you a um, a link to a website, but I think uh, Romans is more important for an outline than First and Second Corinthians because. First and Second Corinthians are not as complex as Romans when it comes to theology. So I uh, gave you the introduction to Romans. I hope that you fully participate in every aspect of the course. Thank you very much for your contributions to the blogs and discussion areas. And please let me know if you have any questions.